Good morning. My name is Bonnie Buckingham, and I want to wish you all a good morning and welcome you to this timely and important event. I think we are expecting a few more people, but we'll go ahead and get started. This Early Childhood Business Summit is an opportunity for businesses and community leaders to look at Montana's most valuable resource, which is our children. As Executive Director of Word, Women's Opportunity and Resource Development, I'm honored to take part in this summit that addresses early childhood issues as they relate to the concerns and businesses of, and individuals also in Montana. Word and the Montana PERC work to ensure that all students succeed regardless of their situation. We envision a socially just world where each person is valued and all are empowered to fulfill their potential regardless of their situation. Through the conscious collective development of the socioeconomic, cultural, and political conditions, we can together ensure equality, independence, and full participation for all. We believe these conditions are indispensable to the health and sustainability of families and of our communities. We all have an interest in understanding how we can improve outcomes for our current and future workforce. I trust that the information provided today will enhance your understanding of the current situation and enlighten you to the possibilities for the future. Most importantly, you as engaged citizens and members and leaders of the business community will have the opportunity to share your experiences, thoughts and ideas about early childhood issues. These insights shared today will inform early childhood leaders around the state so they can work together better with their local business partners. These partnerships will lead to building better and stronger early childhood education systems in all of our communities. These business summits will take place in five locations across the state, in Missoula, Billings, Haver, Kalispell, and Hamilton. They are a joint effort with Word, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Child Care Resource and Referral Network, the Montana Head Start Collaboration Project, and CTA Architects and Engineers. This collaborative effort showcases the breadth of businesses and partners interested in hearing the perspectives of business and community leaders in the area of early childhood development and family-friendly workplaces. Montana Kids Count and the Bureau of Business and Economic Research have a long-standing tradition of providing timely and relevant information both about Montana's children and families and the state's economy. Our first speaker today is going to be Julie Eilers. Julie is the Marketing and Communications Director for the Montana Kids Count and the Bureau of Business and Economic Research. Julie has worked for the Bureau for five years and in communications for the past decade. She holds an undergraduate degree in economics from Bowdoin College and is currently pursuing a Master's in Business Administration at the University of Montana. Her work at the Bureau includes marketing and coordinating the Montana Economic Outlook Seminars, producing the Bureau's publications, including the Montana Business Quarterly and the Montana Kids Count Annual Data Book, which each of you should have received. Um, and she also oversees this, the Center's marketing efforts and events. In addition to her work accomplishments, Julie is a proud new mom of twin sons, born back in February, and she says she will gladly add super mom and baby juggler as skills on her resume. So Julie is kicking off today's program with some information on her research related to investing in early childhood development programs. And we at Word have a big stake in the health and well-being of the future workforce of Montana, as all of you do. We are living in uncertain times and in tough economic times, and the challenges ahead are very daunting. But I believe that the opportunities to grow and prosper remain great as well. I invite you to fully engage in the process, bring your own experiences and knowledge to this conversation, as well as hear what the experts and the leaders have to say today. I also want to say that after this round table today, Margaret Wheatley is going to be giving a keynote um, presentation right next door, and you're welcome to join with that also. So thank you so much for coming. Julie? Okay, let me get situated here. 
some technical difficulties this morning, which is always a fun way to start things off, but we are rolling now. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Up, oh, up a little bit? Okay. Let's get this guy up. So, first of all, I want to start out by thanking you for being here. As your participation means your level of engagement is that much higher. And uh, I certainly do appreciate that. I want to provide you with some background information on the research regarding the challenges and opportunities for Montana's workforce and how that relates to early childhood development. The best way for me to set the stage is to start out with a sh brief video. I'm going to show you a video from James Heckman. He's a University of Chicago economics professor and a Nobel Prize winner at that. He has done a number of, of research on the great gains to be had by investing in early childhood development from birth to age five. So in order to warm into the morning, we're going to watch a little video here. Early investment in our children pays off later, for sure. You want to start at the earliest ages. Those are very important because they lay the foundations for then later learning. The strategy that's best is to try to foster an environment in the home and in the immediate environment of the child that promotes both social, emotional skills as well as cognitive skills. It's like kind of the analogy being like a tree. So if you plant the seed and you water the young seedling, what you'll get is a very firm base and the tree will grow and actually can resist a lot of strain. So the idea that skill begets skill is in early years, you create the skills that make it easier to acquire skills in the future years. What economists like to use the word is, is, is complementarity. It's the idea that somehow more of this makes the other more productive. So in, in the extreme example would be something like a left shoe and a right shoe. If I have a left shoe, it makes having a right shoe a lot more productive. But if we give the, the base early on, it becomes much easier to invest, to teach, and to motivate later on. On the other hand, if the kid develops really poor attitudes, the kid really is, is weak in terms of cognition, the children are not really very highly motivated in any way, it becomes extremely difficult at age 17, 18, and 19 to get them interested in the workplace. So if you're interested in improving the workforce of next uh, century or the rest of this century, what you will do is actually build skills. We also know that the earlier we attack skill deficits, the more effective any intervention will be. You want to start at the earliest ages. packet of information there's for there's more information on Heckman and I would encourage you all to go to his website the Heckman equation there's a number of other videos about his research and findings I show that video because he really showcases in a wonderful way how child development is a foundation for community and economic development as capable children become the foundation of a prosperous and sustainable society so why investment? Why do we use the term investment when talking about early childhood? Well, there's a growing body of evidence that says investing in early childhood pays off in higher rates of return. Heckman says up to 10% rate of return on investment in high quality early childhood development programs. And a study that was done specific to Montana, which is in your packet of information as well, uh, showed a 16% return on investment, and that was from Art Rolnick out of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. Where is that return on investment coming from? Well, it's seen through significant decreases in crime, increased tax revenues from higher earnings, and decreases in public assistance for the participants over the long term. 
The best example of this return on investment is the Michigan Preschool Project, or it's called the High Scope Perry Preschool Project. And some of you may be very familiar with this. It started in 1962 and tracked the impact of two years of high quality preschool on very poor three and four year olds living in Ypsilanti, Michigan. So it was a very comprehensive program and I stress that it was of high quality in that they received daily two and a half hours of classes plus a weekly one and a half hour uh, home visit with the child and the mother. And after these two years, the children entered regular school and they've been tracked for the last 40, 50 years. So what did they find at age 27? Higher rates of completion of high school, fewer arrests, higher earnings, higher basic achievement, and lower uh, welfare and public assistance usage as adults. So this is just one example of how if we're investing in our young children at an early age, it has long-term payoffs. So why is that birth to five gap so critical? I wanna talk a little bit about what I call the brain architecture. The early experiences create a foundation for lifelong learning in both physical and mental health. And it, the best analogy is an architectural framework of a house. The basic architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth and continues into adulthood. Like the construction of a home, Everything is sequential. We must lay the foundation. If any of you are in the building community, you know how important this is. If the foundation isn't laid right, everything else will crumble around it. Uh, everything is in a predictable sequence. Well, the brain architecture is built over a succession of very sensitive periods, with our young years being very sensitive to later growth. Through this process, the quality of the architecture establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the development and behavior that follows. So understanding that the brain really grows in an architectural framework, what are some of the mechanisms that we need to understand in those early years? Well, the one thing we talk about is serve and return, like the process of tennis or volleyball where I serve something up and it comes back to me. We've all seen this in children where they babble to us and they look for interaction and we can either complete that process by miming it back to them. If that process is incomplete, the learning is incomplete and in some of our homes that children are in and the environments, that process is incomplete. Scientists now know that has negative implications for future learning. Soft skills. Soft skills are non-cognitive skills such as sociability, ability to communicate, punctuality, self-control, and deferred gratification. There's a growing body of evidence that says soft skills matter. I think we would all say that our best employees and our best friends for that matter, have, are well-rounded and have a strong body of soft skills. Well, these soft skills can really be formed and honed in our young years. And that is uh, very beneficial to our future workforce. Toxic stress. I use the term toxic stress um, as a means of describing things such as extreme poverty and abuse. And we now know that toxic stress in early childhood can be associated with such things as extreme poverty, abuse, severe maternal depression, and can really damage the developing brain. Unfortunately, it doesn't take much um, as the media and the paper like to sensationalize issues of children dealing with stock toxic stress in their home or in their environment. Now the common thread that's important to know in some of these, including stress and serve and return, is that relationships matter and community matters. Relationships can buffer the outcomes and provide children and families with the tools to cope and persevere through stresses. We think we would all understand that relationships can make a toxic situation tolerable. As business people, I think you can recognize that it's easier to get things done the first time than to try to fix them later. If we work on these mechanisms early on, we're really honing our children to be better workers in the long term. So 
At Montana Kids Count and the Bureau, we believe in data. And I want to set the stage with some data regarding Montana uh, that really focuses on our current workforce and what's happening in terms of work and family. So there are, in Montana, there are 41,000 children under six in need of care. Of that, about 14,000 are coming from single parent households and 27 in a dual working family. Now I want to look at women uh, primarily because women are disproportionately making the decisions about child care and are often uh, dealing with the juggling of the work and family a little bit more than the men in the household. So there are 28,000 women in the labor force with children under six. So it certainly is a demographic that needs some attention in Montana. Now I want to look at cost a little bit. So for one infant to be in a full-time infant center in Montana, it costs $7,178, roughly $600 a month. If we look at that in terms of affordability, for a married household based on Montana wages, that's 11% of the median income and 42% of a single parent female-headed household. Now, I don't say this uh, in terms of justifying the price or wages or things like that. I simply want to put this in perspective of if your budget is being taken up by 42% for childcare, certainly certain decisions are going to be made and sacrifices may be made. And also, as we get back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of stress, 42% of a budget may put stress on a family that um, is, is not always necessary for the home. So how are families balancing work and family? If we're working parents, we all know the issues that go along with what it takes to juggle it all together. I can certainly relate to the juggling lately. <laughs> Uh, a recent study in July 2009 reports that 82% of parents, when faced with the child care crisis, are missing work. So nationwide, people do not have backup care options. They're using unscheduled vacation, and they're using sick time. And you know, there's going to be bumps. That's, that's inevitable. So, but what are the plans, and what is your relationships like, and your community like? that helps you get through those things. And that's where we're all here as community to talk about this. And what does the created stress do in terms of absenteeism? And it not just affects the employee, but it also affects the employer. And I want to talk a little bit more specifically about Montana, because I think we're in a unique situation in Montana in that we are a small business state. Nearly 80% of the establishments in Montana have fewer than 20 employees. It may not be logical for us all to have an in-house daycare. And so what does our community need to do to say to combat these problems? And of those small establishments, the majority of them are zero to four employees. You, one person being out is 25% of your workforce, which for many of us, that can change the, the whole day. So, um, it just, I want to sort of put that in perspective that Montana may have some unique solutions that uh, help us given our, um, our work structure that we have here in this beautiful state. So I want to wrap things up. I know I've given a lot of information to you and uh, hopefully it's churning around in the early morning brain. Um, but what are some takeaways? Here are some uh, as we t speak about investment and in, as I'm getting my MBA, we talk in terms of executive summary. So here are the bullet points. Um, there's a high return on investment for birth to five programs. They make sense financially, not just in the short term, but in the long term. And why do they make sense? Because early learning matters. We need to build a solid brain architecture. Think back to that house and always be thinking of how is the foundation being set? Is it fragile or is it sturdy? Skills beget skills, and building that sturdy foundation really builds solid skills that we can grow on and that we have a healthy uh, workforce. 
Healthy children mean healthy adults. And then finally, uh, Montana's small business base has some unique challenges and opportunities. So what are the state and community solutions to meet the needs of the children? You know, Montana's greatest natural resource is truly our children. And so what, what are we going to do to foster the best environment for our children? And that's really why we're here today. We're looking forward to hearing your perspective, your questions, and your thoughts on this issue. And I want to thank you. I'm going to refrain from taking questions right now because I want to lend that into the group discussion that we're going to have. I will be available this morning if you want to come and talk to me. And as I'm, Daphne and I are always available at Montana Kids Count to an answer any questions you might have regarding children's data and families in Montana. So with that, I will leave it to Mike Halgan, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, why would the industrial enterprises that the Washington companies operate in uh, be somehow interested in early learning? Somehow those two just uh, don't seem to mix. And before I get to introduce uh, Bliss Brown, our speaker, just let me briefly touch on that and to why we've become involved and have been for several years. And it wasn't from a touchy-feely human service, social service uh, background. It happened to be that my boss, uh, Larry Simpkins, has served on the Minneapolis branch of the Federal Reserve. He happened to work with the senior vice president of the, uh, an economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, uh, a guy named Art Rolnick, who happened to write a, the seminal uh, paper, white paper and research that showed, along with uh, Mr. Heckman's research, the vast investment that if you make in children and how it translates into a 16 to 17 percent return on that investment. And if you just talked investment, you know, that's fine. What we were interested in, we've already had a tremendous uh, investment in scholarships. We have about 400 kids going to school at any given time with the scholarships we do through the foundation. And once we looked at Heckman's and Rolnick's and uh, their research, I mean, it showed that we were starting way too late, that, that the real game happened zero to five, that most of the brain development happened during that period of time, and we needed to get in that game. First of all, for a selfish reason, we wanted a workforce that was productive. We wanted a workforce that could show up for work and simply be comfortable with what they were doing, knowing that their children were safe and in a nurturing environment. Now, that's very selfish on our part, but it helps our people be productive and we can uh, make more money. It's profitable that way. And secondly, was, was altruistic, is there's, there's a, you need a better society out there in the end. And it may not be, I mean, one thing Dennis Washington is known for is being able to position himself for 15, 20, and 30 years from now. And so we were not afraid of making that investment now, knowing that the returns weren't going to be there for 10 to 15 to 20 years. So it's, a, it's something that fit directly with our business model. And as we looked at more and more of the research and more and more of the states that were working on early childhood, it fit directly with where we wanted to go with our foundation activities. So it's a, it, it, we have invested in lots of different programs around Montana. We have a, 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 a Polson uh, project going on that's a pilot, and we've got a lot of other programs that we're doing. We're working with the state of Montana on their early learning guidelines, and we've gotten to know several of the professionals around the state in early learning, and it's been fascinating to be able to be around such passionate people about the subjects that they are pursuing. So let me introduce uh, for you uh, the keynote speaker who I think is going to frame this issue in, in ways that are much more interesting uh, than I just did. Uh, Bliss Brown is a uh, mother of three. I think that's the most important you know, part of, uh, I think, anybody's uh, introduction uh, of, on this subject. And I heard her tell a story, uh, I think, last time that she spoke about coming back one day after she'd been uh, or was a, 
a high-level business executive with a bank for you know 15 years and coming back to her family and sitting around the kitchen table and informing them that she was going to quit and go to the seminary or, or I, saw, I may be misremembering that and they were no 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 you can't do that <laughs> you know that will upset the lifestyle that will change our entire um, approach to life and, and uh, couldn't we go to college now can we pay the bills and yet she went on, went on and did that. So she is the Reverend Bliss Brown. She's an Episcopal uh, minister, and she has inspired the uh, global movement for uh, innovative civic projects, uh, uh, and starting with Imagine Chicago back in 1992. And one of her jobs when she was with the, with the bank was vice president and division head at the First National Bank of Chicago, and she worked there from 1975 to 1991. She holds degrees from Yale, uh, Harvard Divinity School and she, Kellogg School of Management in Northwestern uh, um, and at Northwestern she uh, received an award uh, there and uh, there's lots of different credentials that apply to to lots of different areas of civic engagement and human rights and civil rights that that make up her background she's published uh, many journals and articles and two books and she's, her consulting clients include British Airways, uh, Harris Bank, Coastal Management Group, uh, Brand Trust, American Express, and uh, uh, United Way, just to name a few. So let me let uh, Bliss take the podium, and uh, you'll, you're going to just love the presentation she makes and the way she frames it. <clears throat> Well, good morning, and um, I'm from away, as they say, Chicago, um, the land of uh, some of our current political leadership, who I've known for a long time, and are good friends. Um, but what I really, today is a summit, and so when they asked me to give some keynote remarks, I said actually a keynote isn't very helpful when people are coming there to share their own ideas. So what I'd like to do is just have really a very, very few comments, and I'm really here speaking as a mother who was a business executive at the point my children were preschoolers. And just to say a few things about that, back in the mid-80s, I was running a banking division and had three children in four years. And every time, some of my customers thought I was pregnant for four years <laughs> because, you know, as a banker, you only see your customers every three to six months, and they would say, haven't you had that child yet? Because, you know, sort of continuously, I was pregnant for four years. But one of the things I got asked to do as a banker, I got asked by my own senior executives to do in the mid-1980s was to go on to the Illinois governor's Council on Public-Private Child Care Initiatives. The reason that council was formed was because Illinois was really in a kind of a desperate situation, which was that we had had a flood of women into the workplace at every level of employment, and we had a daycare system that was hugely undercapitalized in the state, meaning no, no matter what the price, and I was at the top end of that range as a bank executive, you couldn't find a place for your kids to get care. You couldn't pay for it. You know, most arrangements there for were informal, and of course that was a huge toll on labor force participation. But just on mental health, too. I mean, <laughs> all across the board. You know, when your kids aren't safe, they have your full attention. And I don't care what policy you want to say, you can't make personal calls from work. If your child calls at 2.30 and says, Mommy, I'm scared, you're going to leave work. I mean, that, you know, I don't care what the policy is. That's what you're going to do. So it really became an issue of saying, what do we do? Honestly, what do we do? And who was at the table? The Community Foundation, the Chicago Community Trust, was at the table because they got to set priorities with a lot of foundation money about what we were going to invest in. So, you know, Washington Foundation would have been at the table because people would have said, you know what, there's somebody that gets in and cares about it. People like Hull House were at the table because they were providing daycare and they, were a, they got to be a $30 million social service agency. 
But those sorts of providers, the why was at the table. The universities were at the table. Why? Because they had did a very good job of doing data collection and management. And we really didn't understand where we were. That was part of the thing. At that point, it was an invisible. Everyone could feel it in their personal lives, but nobody really understood what was going on or where the crunches were. And so when we came together as a task force, it wasn't to say, OK, you know, let's put this one to bed. It was to say from the beginning, first of all, let's understand what's going on here. <laughs> you know, and how each of us can play a role in that. And I happen to chair the business subcommittee about that. One of the things that I got to do, and of course, I only worked for one bank. But one of the things that gave me a huge voice inside the bank to do, which I loved as a senior woman in the bank, was to say, oh, let's look at this in the bank, <laughs> you know, which nobody much really wanted to hear about. But to say, you know, it would be really a lack of integrity to chair this committee if the bank weren't leading the way. And that was interesting to me, too, because I could look as a business executive. And I'll tell you, you know, the kind of impacts that you just don't know what they are, and this didn't cost any money. But I remember visit vividly when I got elected a division head at the bank, they always take you know, a picture of you looking important. And, and then they put it, at, splash it on the front page of the bank newspaper. And those pictures always had usually a guy sitting behind their desk. And I said, when the photographer came, do I have a choice about where you take this picture? And they said, yes, of course you do. And I said, good, I'd like you to come to my house on Saturday morning. And I had them take a picture of me reading The Big Friendly Giant to my three young children. And on the Monday when that came out, I got a call from a woman in tears who worked in the lockbox unit three stories below ground level on L3. And she said, you can't imagine how much it meant to me as a mother to see a picture in our bank newspaper of a senior woman with her children. She said, I felt like I had to keep my children a secret in order to keep my job. Well, you know, that just shows you kind of where things were. And, and subsequently, you know, I started realizing how much influence that really, as a business person, I could make in this issue. Not because I was an expert in it, apart from being crazy enough to have three kids in four years, but because I really did want to do a good job as a business executive, and I really was intent on doing a good job as a mother. So, you know, what kinds of things? You know, I got involved in something called the Committee of 100, that in our state, a group of people were invited to be really champions of kids. And all that really meant was that we got emails saying, what's up with kids? When the kids count numbers came out in Illinois, we were on the distribution list. If legislation was pending and they wanted people to lend their weight and call up their um, representatives, they would say, here's what's up that's going on in Springfield. Could you please just call up somebody and talk to them about why this matters? So that was a, just a kind of a general communications loop. Um, and I ended up volunteering to be chairman of the fundraising committee for the new school for my children's Montessori school. Thank goodness for Montessori education. And I just, want to, I just want to end this piece before I tell you a little bit about how this morning is organized by saying, you know, my children now are 24 to 28. Two of the three have been living in Beijing. One is a business entrepreneur, one working in a law firm. And one now is finishing a PhD in clinical psychology at UNC. When my children applied to their various college and graduate programs, every single one of them in the essay where they had to say what have been the most important influences on your life cited their Montessori education three for three and I, I started thinking about that last night knowing that I was going to do this today and I actually went back and got Caroline's essay this was for her PhD 
program. And what she said, and I just thought this was such an elegant summary of why, where this rubber meets the road for me. She said, the Montessori school, and my children, by the way, were in Montessori from 18 months. And they ended up staying there until 14. They just couldn't quite finish preschool. She said, the Montessori school's philosophy of follow the child had the most profound impact because it nurtured my curiosity and encouraged me to investigate my strong intuitions about life. The core philosophy of both my parents and early schooling was that human beings, whatever their baseline set of abilities, are innately motivated to explore the world and to discover their unique abilities and potential, their unique abilities and to fulfill their potential. And they do so most readily in an environment that facilitates the development of individual interests, strengths, and choices. So I guess I'm really here as a witness to say that both as a mother and as a business person, I really became enthusiastic, I would say, about both the importance of this and also about the absolute need for it to be done in a partnership. When they invited me onto the Governor's Commission, I had at that point for six years had undocumented immigrants, taking, all Polish women, taking care of my children. And I said to the person who invited me, I don't want to create a political embarrassment for the governor because it certainly could. And I'm actually right now looking for my next childcare because you know these women would come for two years and then go back to Poland. And I said, you know, I will really this round try my very, 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 very best to get an American citizen. And for the next two weeks, I advertised. I went to the only employment agencies that dealt with daycare in Chicago. And I advertised in the Tribune, and I advertised in the Sun-Times. And at the end of two weeks, I had not had either sent to me by an agency or responded to an ad a single person, a single person that was a US citizen, not one. And I went back to the person with the Governor's Commission and said, there's, no, there's nobody who wants this job. I couldn't get a single person even to interview for it. And they said, you know what? Go ahead, hire someone <laughs> that's undocumented, and we'll make it a public issue. We'll make it a public issue. My kids used to say, Mom, you can never run for political office because you did that. <laughs> and I say, that's good. <laughs> but anyway, so just to say, you know, a lot of these things get handled at a personal level because there isn't the infrastructure. But I was not in a position as a working mother to figure out how to shift the system. I could not shift the policy. I could not build a daycare center <laughs> myself. And so I think the need for this to really be a partnership campaign in any state, not only this one. And you have some particular challenges because of the, the rural character and the small business character in this state. But that just makes it, to me, a really interesting design challenge. You know, it's a coming together issue. So let me say a word about what this, what this rest of this morning is. There are really four sets of questions around which you're going to be engaged in a dialogue. And, and I say a dialogue rather than, um, it's not an information exchange where this is a generative, <laughs> a generative process of having what you think really influence and provoke what you think and how people begin to see how this kind of a partnership can be built. So there are really four areas of treasure hunting going on here. The first is around the research itself. Because as you know, when you're making an investment, the first thing you want to do is you want to have good investment data. You know, what are we really looking at here? What does the market say? And so you've got in your packet there a bunch of good information um, about what the situation, and you also just heard a very good presentation by Julie about what the situation is. So the first question you're going to be exploring at your tables is, what if this data is interesting to you? You know, if you were sitting as the executive making these decisions, and you had to make the case for it, first of all, what's the research that you think deserves to be included? So that if you were really 
chairing a business campaign, a business champion campaign in this state, what would you want people to know and why? And you're a good filter for that. Say, this impresses me. This got my attention. That's the first level of question. Second level of question is around investing in early childhood. We know that some of you at the table, and we heard powerful testimony about this from Mike on behalf of the Washington companies, said, here's why we invested in this. <laughs> here's why it was important. Here's the data that got our attention. And here's why, what we did. And here's why we're investing. And here's how we're investing now. So we're looking for those other stories from you, including in terms of family-friendly workplaces. What are you doing? Because many of you, I'm sure, are here because you are thinking about this and doing something about it. So to get a chance to share some of those stories, really on the way to building a strong business case. <laughs> you know, what's going on that works so that we can do more of that and, and learn from that. And then the third dimension is around the partnership. There are many people in the room whose life is devoted to early childhood education. They're champions, they're service providers, they're policy makers, they're educators, and they're gonna, they're also in this conversation with you. But one of the questions is how do we really build a partnership? So from your point of view, especially as corporate people, and some of you represent for-profit corporations and some represent not-for-profit corporations, but the, the invitation list typically has larger institutional providers of, you know, of goods and services. But as business people, what do you really want? What do you want to both to bring and to get out of the partnership, and how can it work best? My own philosophy about partnering is a good partnership builds the capacity of all of the partners in a way that helps them achieve their core mission better. If it's not doing that, then it's a distraction. <laughs> so from a business point of view, how can a partnership around this help your business? <laughs> help you do your business better? And as an early childhood provider, how can this actually help you provide early childcare better by partnering with business. So that's the third thing on the table. And then finally, that you have a sort of a champion's sign-up sheet on your table, which you'll get to at the end of your conversation, that really just asks for ways in light of this conversation and in light of what you're working on, that you might want to be involved in really furthering this campaign. It's open-ended in the sense that you may say, you know, here's my name, I have no idea what I could contribute to this, but I'm interested, keep me posted on what happens. Or you may say, you know what, I know a lot about marketing. I'm willing to put my shoulder to the wheel and help out when you have questions about this, or whatever. But there's gonna be an opportunity at the end if you sort of say, you know what, this has my attention. This impressed my heart, it impressed my mind, I'd like to do something about it, to say, count on me. Not pressure to do that, but an opportunity to participate in that. So that's what this time is about. You're going to have 10 to 15 minutes in each round of those questions. You have at your um, table a skilled facilitator um, whose job, among other things, is to keep you focused on task. And uh, you also have a note taker because the results of all of this are going to be documented because people are going to use what they learn this morning. We're also asking, at, on each of your tables, you'll see there's a kind of summary sheet for each question. And you know the summary, if the question, for instance, is around good research, the summary question will say says something like, we think this research is compelling. So include this. If you're reaching out to business, include this. We're asking at each table whether there might be someone who loves executive summaries, who gets to the heart of the matter. Don't bore me with the details. There are three points here, and here's what they are. To do that on behalf of your table, because we don't have time in the limited time we have this morning to really debrief this conversation, but we can, the instant it's over, post those summaries on the wall. So you have the benefit of seeing what every table had to say around the same set of questions. 
So if you know that you can get to the heart of things, we would love for you to volunteer at your table to say, I'm going to listen to this conversation and tell you what just got said in a hurry. And write it down so that we can post it and share that out at the end. So is that, is that a clear process? You're in very good hands. And uh, we'll look forward to, to, I'll give you at sort of 10 or 15 minute intervals, just say you might want to think about getting to the next question if you're not there yet. Okay, thank you.